Negros lies in the center of the Philippines. A large island bisected by spiny mountains and given over almost entirely to the production of sugar. Three million people on Negros depend on sugarcane. And even though the price may triple on the world market, their lives remain the same. The sugar workers exist under a feudal system that is cruel, all-encompassing, and dehumanizing. Many of the hacienda, or plantation owners, live in Manila, or Madrid, or New York. Their administrators have homes in comfortable coastal cities. The haciendas are run by overseers, with nearly absolute authority. At the lower end of the scale are the field laborers and the migrant workers. They earn about one dollar a day, if it doesn't rain, and if the truck arrives, and if there is any work to be done. The workers may be employed half the year and make less than $180. There are no paid vacations, not even a paid rest period. If the laborers stop to eat, his wages are docked. Nearly every worker is in debt to the hacienda, and sickness, which is common, may make him indebted for life. The worker's home is simple. His family poor, his health neglected, and his future nearly hopeless. Government attempts at aid have been largely unsuccessful. Labor unions prohibited from striking by martial law have little strength. Even the growing underground movement has difficulty in infiltrating the haciendas. Into the center of this hardship and horror, Father Niall O'Brien, a young Columban missionary, arrived with a revolutionary idea. sort of quirk of fate, I came to be living on Hacienda in a way that priests normally are not living on Haciendas. We have two retreat houses. One of these retreat houses was donated by the Hacienda owner. He gave a piece of his own land in the middle of his Hacienda, and I put up my house right beside that uh, retreat house. And so there I found myself living almost on a Hacienda and very close to the laborers and certainly seeing their day-to-day -day problems in a way which I'd never have seen them if I was living in the town. Rice is a sort of uh, money here. People need rice for daily living and the hacienda provides them a daily ration of rice. And since everybody's in debt, if this ration is withdrawn, they will have no money to buy food for that day. With the result that people cannot afford to uh, stand up to the hacienda system or make complaints in case their rice ration will be reduced. While I was living here on the hacienda and witnessing the life of the people, and also I was allowed to see on one occasion the hacienda account books, and when I saw the amount of money the hacienda was making, about 600,000 pesos, and the amount being spent on labor, which at that time was only 69,000 pesos out of the 600,000, 
I thought to myself, if I was running one of these farms, I thought I could do a better job. That was the first idea that crossed my mind. That idea took root. Aided by a gift of money from an American friend, Father O'Brien decided to purchase land and establish his own community farm, letting the workers run it and own it. Picking the men was the next problem. Well, since I spent many evenings here on the balcony uh, talking with them and having a drink with them, uh, one got to know them quite well and to know the problems in their families. So finally... The first four men uh, helped select four more, and eight families would make up the first uh, contingent of free farmers. At night, Father O'Brien sat on his porch and instructed them in social justice. What I was trying to bring across to them, and which I think they have understood even better than I have, that the, their basic uh, religious intuition should be to try and uh, give to, to serve other people in justice on the basis that justice is the minimum of love. Of love. You can't really start loving till you're first of all being just. And in such a situation as ours, where the greatest crime definitely is injustice, this becomes a sort of special vocation for them. The lessons took many months. Sitting together on that porch, they would discuss the possibilities of that new life. The men discussed planting techniques. The women learned sewing and weaving, because on the new community farm, they must do all the work. There would be no hired laborers. Wealthy friends would say, these people are lazy. These people will deceive you. These people uh, only want to make money. I told them everything that was said and told them that we would have to prove this to be a success and told them that our aim was not to just to make money and become wealthy. Our aim was to live a human, happy life. When landowners learned Father O'Brien wanted to buy land and turn it over to the workers, they refused to sell to him. He had to look for a place in the mountains, for land that had no blood on it, land from which other poor people had not been evicted. On Dakon Kogan, the tall grass mountain, he bought 25 acres. Finally, the day came for us to change. We'd gone up to the city, we had bought the working clothes, we'd bought the espading, which is the knife which you cut the cane, we bought a small little carabao plows, and off they went up the mountains. One of the men who walked up Dakon Kogan that morning was barefoot, in rags, and carrying two scrawny chickens. Father O'Brien had paid off his debt and made him a free man. We picked him because he was the hardest worker on the farm who we knew. After 20 years' work, he owed $70, and he owned nothing in life except the two hands. When they had plowed and planted and built their homes, they sent for their families, and the new life began. I started off with the idea of an honestly run farm, then the idea came to a cooperatively run farm, and then to a communally run farm. And only when we were already going did I realize that what we had in fact was a kibbutz. And I got interested and began to read up about the kibbutz in Israel and to write to the Israeli embassy and ask for more advice. It's amazing how the kibbutz has humanized the work. It's not just that they get two or three times as much money as people get in the old-style plantation, but they know that the cane is theirs. They even sing and joke while they're cutting. And sometimes, uh, for example, I heard uh, one of the men saying to some of his children, 
gather up that cane there. You know it's money. Uh, the idea that they care about it, almost lovingly. Passing a field, they'll jump in and pull out a weed. Uh, just like that. It's a case of humanization of work, not just raising wages. They started with one carabao, added a tractor, and then received a truck from Goethe, an Irish aid organization. But success required that everyone be totally involved. The idea of common life in the kibbutz is really based on their own type of life already. The idea of sharing for them is second nature, and it just needs to be institutionalized and become part of the way of life and officially blessed for it to thrive even more. Communism has gone wrong in its rejection of God, whereas the basis of the kibbutz is the desire to share with everybody because of God. The kibbutz is about 100 kilometers away from here, about two and a half hours ride because the road is quite rough in a, in a truck or in a car. It's not always accessible. So as a result, I don't go there too often. The members of the kibbutz administer the farm themselves completely. They control all the money and have a checking account. For me, I remain as an advisor and as a sort of screener of new members. And um, I sort of help to be a sort of um, foil which they can put the blame on me if they've got to refuse something to somebody. I'm, I have brought in a few rules which I'm drawing up with them in the form of a constitution. So we sit down together and hammer out these different rules. A few months ago I wasn't sure how the kibbutz was going to turn out. But now that the first crop has come in and that they've collected the money uh, and that they have <coughs> know how to keep it and how to put it by for helping other people and not to squander it on their own selves, I feel that at this stage the kibbutz is already a success. Well, as Christians, our vocation is to spread Christ's message of love and to teach as priests, we have specifically to teach this. You can do it by sermons, but when people are living in a society, the very structures of which militate against loving, because the nature of society is that man lives off his fellow man. And in this type of life, it's very hard for love to flower. My hope and dream is, and they're with me in this, is that every year they will add to their land, and every year that uh, more families will come up. But at the same time, I have been contacting various funding agencies to make the uh, spread a little faster at the beginning. Eventually, if they should own one of the large plantations in five or ten years' time, there's no reason why it shouldn't go ahead by leaps and bounds, slowly eating up... The, this is somewhat of a dream. <laughs> slowly eating up the old plantations and uh, turning them into a new form of community life. Our little kibbutz is only a drop in the ocean and I suppose it seems sort of quixotic that to plan to renew the whole of Negros through such a scheme. It took 150 years for the present plantation ills to develop and it will take a long time to remove them and we don't expect it to happen in a couple of years. I would think that in 10 or 20 or 30 years with uh, a little outside help, with encouragement, and with the keeping the vision alive of what we're trying to do, I think we could make serious inroads into the present system of injustice in Negros. I don't think I myself could carry on without a, some hope in the middle of such terrible suffering which one sees all around. 
But the kibbutz, which we call, or which they call, I should say, because they gave the name to it, Iwag Santa Maria, uh, the light of Our Lady. And uh, this, the kibbutz, the farm, has been for me uh, a hope, and certainly for them. I, I hope that it will spread and help to renew the face of the earth. Thank you.